Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with my friend Dave Everett of YouTube and Instagram's This Old Sword Blade Reviews. Dave is a bit of a kindred spirit. He's a creative type. He's trained for years with some of the best Jeet Kune Do and Kali instructors. He's been collecting knives since the early 1980s or maybe before, and has a very diverse collection of knives, swords, and other implements of mayhem. When I met Dave a few years back, he had a great collection. But since starting this old sword blade reviews, which posts knife content daily, I'm pretty sure, his collection seems to have reached museum-like proportions and importance. We're going to catch up with Dave and get his perspective on knife collecting and usage and the knife world today. But first, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. That way you can listen to the show whilst on the go. And as always, join us on Patreon. If you want knife giveaways, stickers, exclusive content, including interview extras and knife combatives videos with Ian Lewis, then Patreon is the place for you. The quickest way to get there is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. I will uh, read that again. That is the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Hello, Dave. Welcome back to the show. How you doing? Thank you, Bob. Thanks for having me. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I guess everything went good the first time. So here I am again. Indeed, indeed. Well, <laughs> I want to congratulate you on the success of your channel, This Old, old Sword Blade Reviews. It is um, one of my favorite channels because it covers knives that a lot of people don't cover, and it covers it from a perspective that most people cannot cover knives from. Uh, what were your goals uh, I just want to find out a little bit about your goals in starting this so people have an idea uh, about your channel if they don't know it yet. Yeah, um, I do it for the fun. I really do. Um, I can't really get competitive with it because uh, I'm seeing some of these other YouTuber knife channels, so, you know, taking off like a rocket. And, you know, the way I look at it is everybody's got their style. Uh, everybody's got their uh, interests. Uh, and everybody has their skills that they share. Uh, I mean, I sharpen my own knives, but uh, I'm nowhere near the knife sharpener that, let's say, Crazy Sharp or Jared is, you know, and I, I don't get into it to that depth. Maybe maybe I would one day. But um, as you know, I uh, draw from some of my martial arts experience. So... Um, when I got really into knives after collecting them just out of interest in probably the, uh, from the seventies through the eighties, uh, the interesting thing about that was I was kind of right in the sweet spot of, uh, knives being developed like cold steel's Tonto in the early eighties, the Bally song in the early eighties, and the emergence of these companies, some of which have stuck around with us for a long time. So um, then when I got into the Filipino martial arts training in the 80s, um, I, had, I had the implements, but now I could create a language out of that, if, if you want to look at it that way. I began to understand what to do with them and what blade shapes could do what, what was useful, what wasn't useful. And I probably have more background in that than I have in, uh, you know, give me a knife that I can go out in the woods with and uh, do prepping. You know, I, I may not, I'll bring a kitchen knife out if I know that <laughs> I have to prepare a steak and, and throw it on the fire, right? Right, right. Uh, other guys have very specific needs and, and wants when it comes to, that use of knife. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is I have less utility use and background of knives than I do of the martial use 
of the knives. And um, as uh, we discussed in the, the last uh, time we met, uh, my background is in Filipino martial arts with uh, Grand Tuhan Leo Gahe and uh, Tuhan Bill McGrath. They were the main guys who gave me my knife background. Um, I also studied a bit directly with Dan and Asanto through some camps. Uh, they were camps that, strangely enough, I went to see Dan and ended up meeting Leo. So uh, that was a long time ago, too. That was back in the 80s. And we were uh, walking around a uh, soccer field, swinging our sticks and getting blisters on our hands and rolling on our backs on uh, asphalt uh, basketball courts and uh, all kinds of interesting stuff. I had an uh, opportunity to train with Leo Gahe. He, he came to uh, with Tuhan Leo Gahe, uh, the the Grand Master of Pekiti Tershakali, I think still. And I also had a chance to to train with his nephew. And I, I think unfortunately they had a rift somewhere along the way. But uh, it was a in a very uh, up close and personal way in a very small class. It was just a regular class, and they happened to to be there because they knew my teacher. And it was amazing uh, uh, being <laughs> being handled by Leo Guy. Uh, he was in his late 80s, and he threw me with incredible violence to about an inch to the floor and then yeah. gently, gently laid me on the ground. Like, it was terrifying until I was like, oh, my God, this guy could have just killed me. Amazing power, but also amazing restraint. Well, it's interesting. Prior to learning from Leo... I had uh, many years of Japanese martial arts, uh, many years of Chinese martial arts, and in uh, and Aikido. In Aikido, you know, you have all the various wrist twists and locks and control, uh, which are uh, kind of akin to jujitsu, uh, but a, a little more gentle. Uh, when I met Leo, he was doing all the same stuff, but applying it in totally different ways and in incorporating sticks and knives into the locks and into the throws. And my mind was blown. I said, I got to learn this stuff because it took what I already knew. And now it was the next several uh, iterations of it. It was right. you know, evolving it. And, and when you see that happen as a martial artist, you, you know a few things. And then somebody shows you the next few phases you say, wow, this is a continuum. So, you know, yeah. it, it, it's a circle. So you go once around the circle and then you go with the next time around the circle and you're spiraling, but you're drilling deeper. You know, that circle just keeps going and going and, you know, you're headed somewhere. So that was the feeling that I got. Uh, and strangely enough, my wife was the one that interested us in uh, the Filipino martial arts because mm -hmm. She was a student of mine and helped run the school that we had, White Lotus. So she was teaching uh, Kung Fu. Uh, she was teaching uh, Tai Chi to a degree and uh, tra uh, strength and uh, stretch training. And uh, she had a background in dance, a very long background in dance. And uh, we trained together at the school, but she ventured out. She saw something about Dan and Asanto and that interested her and, uh, she got in with a local Kali guy that was doing the precess uh, system. And uh, we gradually brought that into the school, starting with the sticks and then the knives and the footwork and, and some of the, the principles that come from uh, Filipino martial arts. Because, you know, really Filipino martial arts is principle based. Uh, you don't have to learn, uh, you know, 100 movement forms and you don't have to learn all this preordained stuff. It's more drill format, as you know. So, you know, and you you don't have, there's three things you don't have in Filipino martial arts. No blocks, no stances, and no forms. So instead of blocks, you have deflections. Instead of forms, you have drills. And instead of... Uh, uh, stances, you have footwork. Stances, you have footwork. Yeah. Because you're like a boxer, your feet are always moving. It's pointless to stay in one place. But then again, those people will tell you that teach you that, that really that's just the beginning and that's the structure, that's the foundation. And, you know, you're going to learn to walk with that. You're going to learn to run with that. So, which I think is by and large true, but 
the methods of training, and I'm not putting down the Japanese martial arts or, you know, Chinese martial arts or any of the others, but they're very regimented. Mm. Uh, and it's just a different kind of thinking uh, from the, the Philippines. And those people had to survive. Uh, they were the marchlands for uh, lots of other people, you know, throughout the, uh, the centuries. I, I feel like it's the difference between um, memorizing a response to yeah. uh, to a statement in a conversation as opposed to having your thoughts together and having a, a vocabulary and right. being able to form a sentence on the go. Yeah, I have no notes tonight, so I'm at <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like that, uh, you know, yeah. and same thing with Jeet Kune Do or, or um, uh, with like Wing Chun and, and trapping and that kind of thing. It's like a it's like a conversation. So you mentioned you were kind of around at, at uh, a fortuitous time for uh, modern knives. You were in California in the 80s, uh, early 80s, um, when I guess the Pacific was, Knife I was Company in, California or in the late 60s, Bob. Okay. All right. So it, okay. into the early seventies. And then basically I was running a school in the uh, late seventies into the nineties. Okay. But you were, you yeah. were there for the birth of, for instance, the cold steel Tonto um, yeah. and, uh, and the Bally song at, uh, as per Benchmade or Pacific right. knife company, whatever they were called at the time. Is that what they were called? Pacific knife. So no, that was the actually the second iteration. They were called the Bally Song Company. Oh, okay. And they were in Burbank, California, lovely downtown Burbank. You remember uh, the laughing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. so, see, I dating myself. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean Jeff and Mata and those guys were doing the Bally Song. Lynn had just created the Americanized Tonto. It's funny because I posted a knife of. Uh, a week or so ago, that was uh, a, a, an effing growl knife, of uh -huh. all things, kind of a real budget knife. It looked great, and it had your traditional Tonto blade. And somebody said, you know, you must have the wrong picture up. That's not a Tonto. And so right away I'm thinking, the only Tonto this guy knows is the Chisel Point Tonto. Yeah. Which was really taking the tip of specialized swords and transposing them onto a knife because none of the knives ever had that tip traditionally in Japan. They had something more like that. Right. Okay. And that's the, the Osuraku style of uh, uh, Williams design. God, it's beautiful. Which, which is a little different. This is my new favorite fixed blade, by the way. Oh, yeah. I love those James Williams uh, designs. What Now, what kind of Tonto did you call that? Osuraku. Uh, Osuraku. Osuraku. Is what Williams calls it. But this was designed by his son, Chris. Oh, okay. All right. So when, so at this time, like, were, were you aware that something was changing? Uh, did you see? Okay. My, my interest is that you have been a part of the knife world longer than many of us. And it's cool to see, it's interesting to see your take of um, when did the knife world go from just, yeah, this is something you have because everyone carries a pocket knife and everyone goes hunting to this is something that's a little more specialized and a little more, you know, expensive, interesting and exclusive or yeah. what have you. It was an explosion and we didn't have social electronic media. Everything was coming through Inside Kung Fu Magazine, Black Belt Magazine, uh, Karate Illustrated, okay? And that's where you would see poses of Jeff Amada. As you know, Jeff Amada became a stuntman. Uh, he became a, a stunt coordinator. And uh, he was featured in, I don't know if you remember the movie, Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, yeah. You kidding Kurt me? Russell. Yeah. So, you know, he was in that. He was a bad guy in that. Um, he was in a bunch of other films. So was Dan Inosanto. Uh, Dan Inosanto was in Sharky's Machine. He flipped the ballet song and he was going to get uh, uh, Bert. Uh, what's Bert's name? Reynolds. <laughs> Bert Reynolds. Bert Reynolds in Sharky's Machine. He was going to, you know, threaten to cut him up and so forth. I mean, the ballet song was showing up everywhere. Uh, maybe not so much the Cold Steel Tonto. Because you couldn't do much with the Tonto that you could do with the ballet song. The ballet song was flashy. 
You know, you yeah, can snap yeah. it around. And uh, nowadays, what they're doing with the ballet song, I mean, that that's not even ballet song technique. That's acrobatics. I mean, that, that that's you know, it's off the charts. That's hacky it's sack. Not, <laughs> it's not really martial. You know, it doesn't have a big martial value, but I call it the yo-yo of, uh, and I don't get offended people that are that are way better twirling that thing around your fingers than I am. Um, but uh, you know, it's become the yo-yo of knives. And there's these guys that you know remember the yo-yo that they could whip it around and and make it walk on the floor, and they could have two of them and. You know, it kind of looked like somebody twirling, uh, you know, swords with, uh, with well, yo-yo. The funny thing is, is that it gets lumped in with uh, gravity knives and switch, uh, switch blades, automatics, and yeah, it, it it's a totally different thing. It takes a different skill set, and uh, um, I, I think I think it uh, it uh, the ballet song must have really uh, mystified people when they saw it. It's like, yeah. Oh my God, what is this thing? It's yeah. cl you know, clickety clack. And it's man. Here's if my, you, if you have skills with song. that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, gravity knife knife, the Riyadh, but it's, it's like, yeah. it's like the, uh, the idea being it. Well, if you're good enough to open up a ballet song, you must be dangerous, you know? Well, and, yeah. And I think uh, it, it, sort of parallels the switchblade, right? Which uh, apparently Mar Marlon Brando made uh, infamous in, in the his uh, biker gang movie oh, yeah. there. Uh, the wild one. Was that on the riverfront? No, that was the wild ones, right? Yeah. And, you know, you talk a lot about knife laws because I know that, uh, you know, you have, uh, and uh, his name is... Uh, slipping my uh, memory right now, but you yeah, know, Doug yeah. Ritter, he's going to be on Ritter, real right. soon. Yeah, and uh, in your state, you now have uh, the ability to carry automatic knife. Yes, yes, I do. That's a beautiful one, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so you know, it's thanks to people like Doug that we get the loosening of these laws which were ridiculous in the first place. You know, I think I mentioned last time and I might've mentioned somewhere else in some interview that um, in my state here, Connecticut, uh, there was a, there was a mental health institution uh, called Connecticut. Typically it was called Connecticut Valley. It has another name now uh, back in maybe the eighties or nineties, a young girl was uh, knifed by a guy who they had out on a, a day pass. And what did he do it with? He went into a hardware store and bought a steak knife. And he ha held it in his uh, belt in a piece of cardboard. So any knife can be dangerous uh, because there's a spring in it because it flips out. Um, I think a sheath knife is available just as quickly or more quickly than oh, yeah. a uh, a gravity knife or a uh, a switchblade. Yeah, as as is an assisted or anything on bearings with a flipper or right or an Emerson, uh, you know that comes wave opening. Right. Yeah, so it it it's all about it's all about the looks and that that story about the uh, about the steak knife. That's always the story. It's never a switchblade. It's never any of these knives that we yeah. collect. It's a kitchen knife or a steak knife uh, is what 90 percent or better of the the knife assaults and it's usually somebody that gets into an emotional uh they know each other usually and it's usually a couple and one person ticks off the other person it escalates and they grab the nearest thing basically yeah that's a that's a an interesting um thing for for people like us who um collect knives we're a little bit more interested in knives uh as weapons uh, or in the martial um application you know it's taken me uh time in the in the knife world and watching you know eight billion knife videos to get into edc knives now i do like little uh edc knives like this say for instance this qsp penguin I like this little knife, but this is not my wheelhouse. You know, I, I do right. like the bigger, more uh, martial, martial things. What, what is your wheelhouse? 
Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I made a list because we had some communications on this earlier, right? And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I tried to get one or two on the table near me of each of these. Uh, I would say my wheelhouse is probably best represented. There's, there's column A and there's column B. Column A is everything like Bastinelli and um, tactically oriented. Beautiful designs. He calls it tactical art, which is a mm -hmm. perfect term. Yeah. Uh, and I follow him religiously. Every new thing he comes out with, I have my eyes on. Uh, but I also really appreciate um, stuff like uh, this recent acquisition. By Israel oh, yeah. Pacas. I just yeah. love the grind on that. I mean, it's it's wicked, but at the same time, it can be utilitarian. And this is the Abyss by Arcane Designs. Just beautiful. I love his work. I only have one of his uh, knives. I happen to have his Pratheon here. I have to uh, send it back to him. I've had it oh, in for yeah, review. Oh, yeah, I saw that. And and this is sort of in the two hundred dollar range S thirty five VN G ten. I was uh, saved from that because it's too small. Yes, yes, I, you I, you. I like big knives. That's another category, right? Well, I think you and I rely on that on the love of big knives to keep us ourselves from buying them all because you there are so many interested in this. So many beautiful little ones out there. And if they're too small, unlike that one, you know, I'm just not going to spend the money. This one's I love awesome. these and I, I love the Max Ace knives. So as far as large folders go, this is probably my grail right here. And I have you to thank for loaning me yours. Uh, but I upped the game. I got the M390. Yeah. And, and the con uh, contoured scale. I don't know if you knew this, but they changed the disc. You see the little gear pattern around there? Mm -hmm. This will wave out of the pocket. Oh, nice. You just, uh, if I may. <laughs> Love that thing. That's so, a, that's a, what, a four and four and three quarters inch Warren Cliff, right? He, he doesn't advertise it as a uh, pocket opener either we can't yeah. say wave of course Mr. yeah <laughs> or you you got to send a check yeah to, to, yeah so okay so large folders um yeah but i have noticed uh recently that you have been exploring a lot with different brands uh okay so bastinelli is the is is home base you know he's he's your home base so to speak but what are all these other brands? Six Leaf, all these brands you've been checking out. Uh, man, yeah. I, I can't keep up with all these brands. I, I wish I had uh, brought some six, six Leaves out. I don't know that I have anything uh, offbeat. You were mentioning Artisan, right? Mm -hmm. That you wanted to get into more Artisans. I have uh, a pretty nice sub-collection of Artisan knives. And you like the old-fashioned style Barlow knives. Oh, yeah, that's cool. What's that one called? So what is this one called? I know it's designed by D. Rocket. Oh, okay. That is slick. And it's a four-incher, Bob. Oh, right on. So it will kind of get that same interest that you have in the... Uh, uh, in the... Uh, the um, slip joint knives, right? Yeah. And, and some of those that are coming out now. I'll get you the name on this one real quick. See, that's why the database is good. Hyperion. Hyperion. And and it brings those uh, those aesthetics, the the um, 
slip lock aesthetics into that flipper, kind of like the Finch knives, which uh, right. I, I know you don't have any Finch knives, right? Because I have little... one Finch knife. I have the Roadrunner. Oh, the Roadrunner, the one that looks a bit like a like a Italian stiletto. Yeah, and I did a uh, review on that one. But here's another artisan you might like. I was just eyeing that one up today. And uh, you know who designed this one. That's got to be a Pinkerton, right? That's a Pinkerton, yeah. Yeah. This is the Tacit. Um, cool. it's, uh, it's a really cool kind of a slightly upturned Tonto, and I don't know if you can tell or not, but it is Damascus. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, I can see. I can see it in this light. Uh, so it's not a... Like many Pinkerton knives, it's not a big knife. You know, he tends to like to design somewhat smaller knives. And I think it's for the reason that he likes them to be pocketable and available. Yeah, little big knife. I got this Pinkerton from you in a trade, remember, uh, of that yeah. uh, blackjack. And this is such a cool uh, Pical style knife. This is the inversion. And it's a great uh, frame lock, um, titanium frame lock, but it's got that blade uh, looking like it's on there backwards. But it works great as a utility knife and as a self-defense knife. This this is a this was a cool, uh, yeah, great I, I trade. I get that one back one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> so what are what are your what are your recent favorites? You know, you you've been exploring. You've been looking. Six Leaf, I think, is uh, is the budget brand to Tucson, right? And everyone's well, got. Petrified Fish, Bob, is has got to be oh, yeah. my favorite budget brand. Yeah. Well, we're talking $35 to $55 knives. Um, it's them. And then a bump above that, I would say Damn Designs. Yeah, I do like Damn Designs. Uh, I don't I don't own any. I would like to. Um, but uh, um, yeah, yeah, just, just going back. Petrified Fish weird name strange you know out of nowhere they pop out of nowhere yep. and uh i i was kind of looking a little askance at them and then you sent me one to, to give away i was like oh this is very high quality i wasn't crazy about the design and then the beluga came out and i got that on loan and i was amazed by that and then i got this the victor not this one but i got the victor and uh man that that thing has knocked my socks off i love the victor your favorite color, Bob. Yeah, I love that. Denim micarta. Reminds me of my days, my mall days. <laughs> love that. And uh, with that wide, uh, ever-expanding Tonto, that's a pretty interesting uh, Tonto blade shape on this. They had to, uh, not everybody knows this, but I did see LTK measuring it up, and I measured it up. They had to widen the handle on the Beluga to handle the Tonto. Oh, interesting. The dimensions are actually, I think, somewhere around a tenth of an inch wider in order to uh, manage this. And I'm not a front flipper kind of a guy, but that the, it's the blade that gets wider near the belly. God, I love that. <laughs> and that's why they needed to widen the handle. So this, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, if you would just open that back up. This really maximizes uh, the faceting, maximizes the damaging effect of the faceting uh, that yeah. you see in, in the Americanized Tonto because you've got that downward angle from the knuckles. And that yeah. downward angle is kind of like a recurve, but it also makes that secondary point even pointier. And uh, so that thing is... Man, that's a wicked that's a wicked knife, and I see that being a great crossover Tonto for people who don't like Tontos but love this brand. You know what I mean? You have that leading point, mm -hmm. and then you have your primary point, and you have a little bit of um, a downward turn. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. So he, they dropped the point a little bit as well. And I, th I think it's a fabulous design. I saw it, I think, on Instagram. And uh, it might have been Nashhorn, who was the designer that was showing it on Instagram. And um, while we're on the topic of petrified fish, I'll just show you one that was my first favorite. 
and this is the warrior hmm. yeah i have seen the warrior i, I like the uh it reminds me a little bit of a Sinkovich here just a yeah, little bit and uh, it's the first time i saw that uh swirled uh i they tell me it's a carbon fiber uh, g10 mix mm. but uh yeah. it feels beautiful in the hand i've got one with an ebony handle as well who are these guys it, did did they just <laughs> were they doing something else were they making kitchen knives and decided to flex in this direction or what they just you know what uh check out the trevisa brand as another budget knife i drop i'll be dropping a review of uh a cleaver style blade uh, uh tomorrow's uh video and uh, i don't think i have that one handy but uh t-r-i-v-i-s-a trevisa Trevisa. Yeah. How, how do you decide uh, the direction of the channel in terms of content? How do you decide where you're going to go, what you're going to cover? It's easy. It has no direction. It's just what you like. I, I see something that interests me that I think would interest other people. And usually you can get a read on it by popping it up on Instagram and showing, a, mm -hmm. you know, one minute opening video or uh, a still. And you can sort of see the reaction to it. Uh, and that gives me kind of a read on how well it's going to be received on YouTube. But uh, today I dropped the video on uh, the Zealot, which was a, uh, it's a Max Ace, another large knife, a four incher. And uh, I think reaction wise, views wise, that flopped. Mm -hmm. okay. And yet you, you put a, uh, <laughs> A Goliath two up there, and everybody goes wild over it. So, oh, interesting. Everybody's the tastes are getting very, very refined, um, and the glut of knives coming out. If you, Savivi drops ten different models at a time now, and I've cut back on Savivis, although I've got some Sen cuts coming in. Uh, they've kind of taken over in that. Uh, dollar space that um, Savivi mm -hmm. used to be in like the uh, $40 range, you know, and now Savivis are, you know, they're bumping up just a little bit. Uh, real quick, though, you were asking me about new brands and Beyond EDC is doing a great job. This is a Dirk Pinkerton design. This is the Gara, which is Spanish for claw. That's pretty cool. And, um, it opens solely with the fuller. No flipper. Nice. Uh, this one's got a uh, real nice tan micarta, kind of a gray tan micarta. And Dirk's design on this is very martial because he raised the point. You see how the whole blade angles up from the handle? Mm -hmm. So you still have some thrusting midline point yeah but then you have definitely have a uh, gashing or slashing ability with the knife i like beyond edc's uh three-tiered structure uh there are a number of companies who, who are doing something like that but i like that they have uh the beyond edc tier and i believe the gara is on that and then they have the midline which is called the um Oh, I inversion or something. And then the third is the Terra, Terra, Van, right. Terra Nova, Terra. Oh boy, I should have done my research. But it, it, those right. three tiers, <laughs> it, it's, it's all a muddled mass for me, too, Bob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Muddled mass is about it's, right. But, uh, you know, the, the aging brain, I've, I've got to work on what my wife calls. Uh, she's uh, studied a lot of gerontology. So, See, I'm all prepped for, for my the next few years of my life, but they call it brain plasticity. Oh, you know, yeah. You work on your doing, plasticity. So doing, <laughs> doing your crossword that's puzzles. Why, and That's why I do uh, mental gymnastics in front of a computer all day long. It keeps me young. <laughs> all right. Well, it's not helping me right now. <laughs> Tara, <laughs> Tara, nah. Tara well, Vantium? 
No, Teravantium is that is that uh, uh, you're not dendritic thinking of terrain, cobalt. Terrain 365. No, no, no. I'm thinking okay. of uh, Beyond EDC. There are three levels. Okay. And and so you can you can get into their you know you can get into a fifty sixty dollar knife with them, a one fifty dollar knife, or a three hundred dollar. Yeah. You know, the Demco River Wolf, for instance, is in their uh, Terra, whatever it was. Uh, they're high Wait tier. Dirk's, Dirk's got a Spanish style knife that they're going to do. Have you seen? Yeah, that? yeah. I checked it out uh, at at the Beyond EDC table. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I got to say, it's pretty cool. I, I believe me. I uh, I really love Dirk Dirk's designs, and I love especially his uh, homages to ethnographic weaponry. Uh, but I have to say, I, I I'm not crazy about his interpretation of the Navaja. One of my favorite okay. all time. Things. Same thing with Ed Shemp, though. Ed Shemp did the Navaja for. Oh yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, what a what a dog. I, I think most yeah. of his designs are like that. They feel good in hand, but man, yeah, it was ugly. kind of a dud. Well, I really love this custom from Dirk. Let's see. <clears throat> oh, very nice. Oh yeah, that that blade shape is very much like the inversion. All right, this Jim's is, helping me out um, here. This is his Smilodon. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is this is a hybrid where he took a handle from another one of his designs and made it the Smilodon uh, blade to it. Now here's his standard run of the mill Smilodon. He does this in a Tonto as well, but you can see the differences in yeah. the handle. Yeah, the one the one in your right hand you wear under the suit, the one in your left hand you wear on a combat rig or something. You know what I mean? Like one's yeah, that one looks one double hideable. edged. God, that's and beautiful. This that is little single edge. And you're right. This is ex almost exactly like the inversion, but boy, does your hand lock in mm -mm. between uh, the the pommel? It's perfect for me for my size hand. I wanted something that would lock me in. And I wouldn't feel compromised that the handle was too small. Yeah. On uh, that yeah. other one, uh, it's getting really small. The handle disappears. Yeah. But it does have the advantage of uh, being used uh, in this position as well. You just got to don't careful of the yeah. finger on top. Well, <laughs> also, also having that tiny handle nestled into your palm also means that uh the chances of being disarmed are are right far less right. but 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 chances are with a pakal style knife uh, it's going to be difficult to disarm you anyway because all you got to do is turn your wrist and i just want to for the record state uh jim is yeah. helping me out here beyond edc featuring desirable designs with budget-minded materials that's the the first tier the second tier is the asymmetrical tier and that's featuring higher end handle materials and then Terra Mundi is the is the ah, premium, Terra and that's Mundi. featuring <laughs> high end handle materials with premium super steel blade stock. So, yeah, there those you go. Those are the ladies. ones I can't really afford every day. I, I, I think you know in terms of collecting. So you're asking me these questions about you know what to select. I think you know about every fifth knife or so I'll get something pretty expensive, like the uh, the arcane designs, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I won't carry the thing because I'm afraid to, you know, do this, that, and the other thing to it. But something like a damn designs knife, um, they're they've come out with uh, this new line where they're using the uh, titanium handles. Hmm. This is the basilisk. Uh, this is just a great beat around knife. And it comes, you know, pre-distressed there with oh, the, nice. with all that uh, that stone wash. Well, that's nice because you don't feel like you can't bang it up. A no. and B, I'm I'm liking that uh, titanium liner locks are are kind of making a little. Uh, I'm making a minor yeah. splash, if you will. Yeah. Uh, nothing like the button lock, but they're they're making a quiet comeback, and I like that because. Uh, so many knives I uh, have, especially those that are more slender, just give me a hard time when I try to flip them open due to due to ham fisting them. You know, maybe it's my problem. Yeah. But um, so 
what are the you were talking about front flippers and how you're not much of a front flipper guy i i have a couple oh. of recent new front flippers i love this concept bulldozer for instance oh, yeah 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 i but i yeah i saw you talking about that one bob so i thought i would uh up the game a little with you tonight <sighs> As always, let's see. I it. got gotta gotta one up you, man. <laughs> oh boy, you know what? I'm an enabler. I, I might I, have brought the I might have brought the wrong knife down, man. <laughs> Hang on, no concept, concept. Here we go. Concept. Well, I got that one. Man, I oh yeah. Got that That's a one. class. I do love the concept knives. I, um, I really I'm, dig them. I'm digging it out here. Good lord. I think it's the last choice here. Here we go. Like I was telling you earlier before we got started, it's like I got trays of knives here. Ah, finally, I can up the game. Let's see. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> he pulls out a titanium bulldozer. Such a cool knife. It's a, such a great knife, man. I, I think the uh, 20 C, 20 CV on this one too. Great cutter. This, this just, this yep. just has D two. So you, you, you cut through butter and you have to sharpen it again. Cause it's, <laughs> it's not super steel, but, but you were, you were saying before about how you're, you're not quite a uh, uh, front flipper guy. I was saying that for a while. I've gotten much better at, you know, uh, front flipping, but what are the trends that you like and wh where do you think it's going? What do you think is going to be big? Obviously we know the button lock is huge right now. Um, but yeah. where do you think things go from here? I think we'll see more button locks. I think we're at the same time, we're going to have problems surrounding the button locks because they can go out of alignment fairly easily. Now, Jared came up with a perfect solution for the one you just showed tonight. The, um, uh, the Kaiser, the big lighter, right? Um, mine began to freeze up and um, it got sticky. Hmm. It you couldn't open it sometimes, and other times you could. And he had the perfect solution, he figured it right out. The scale on the top where the button goes in, where the plunge lock goes in. If it gets the slightest bit torqued out of alignment, your button begins getting stuck. Mm. And when the button gets stuck, you can't use the flipper because it's fighting the button. It's fighting the lock. And I found this on at least one or two of the knives that I have that are button locks now. But I use Jared's uh, technique, which is to loosen all the screws on that side, including the pivot. Take them out, put a little Loctite, blue Loctite on the tips, and then sequentially go around the clock and tighten them slowly to get the pressure even on that scale. Hmm, I could see that that would be a problem. And then once I did that, I haven't had a problem with that big lighter since. And there are people, Bob, that haven't had any problem with it at all, so... But since I ran into a problem with that in one of the Civivi, uh, forget the first ones that were coming out with the, the button. Cogent. The cogent. The cogent. Um, the technique works. That's funny. Those, those, those so. are the only two button locks I have. Yep. <laughs> the, the cogent and the beg lighter too. Well, I hope I don't uh, run into those uh, issues. But if I do, that's a, that's a good tip. Uh, Jared's got the video up. Tip. So, yeah, it, it works. So what, what else? Uh, what do you see uh, besides blade think, shapes uh, uh, anything I, I think there's more of an interest in small fixed blades yeah. i'm going to go out on a limb and say that um i think you know people like to sit and fidget with their knives you can't fidget with a fixed blade but the uh, people who are serious about uh, it's like steel city you know you did the review mm -hmm. on the steel city uh fang right yeah I just watched that today and uh, he's been in touch with me and I know that that's going to come my way and I'm going to do a review on it. Uh, that to me is kind of an echo of the clinch pick, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
which is basically a handle that fits right into your palm and a claw that comes pretty much straight out. Um, I think for people that are going to carry a knife seriously, um, I think if you carry a knife rather flirtatiously, if you will, with the idea that, you know, hey, because I got it in my pocket, I'm all set, right? You don't have any technique. You haven't practiced taking it out and putting it into action quickly. You haven't thought of scenarios. You haven't gone through your uh, mental color scheme, which is like the Jeff Cooper uh, gun sight, um, mm -hmm. you know, white, yellow, orange, red. You may have heard of that. Yeah. Do that. Do those mental uh, drills every day as you're walking down the street, as you're in your house or whatnot. Uh, white means you have no awareness of what's going on around you. You're busy listening to your tunes. You're, you know, in, absorbed into something else. Yellow means now that you have an awareness of your environment and what's happening around you. Uh, this doesn't happen when you're reading your cell phone text messages and driving down the, the highway at 70 miles an hour. So, uh, and then orange means you're preparing a scheme of action. So, and then red is basically equates to pulling the trigger. It means you've got a preordained set of tasks that you're ready to act on. And, you know, you mentally pull the trigger and say, go, right? Uh, and you act and there's no looking back. Uh, that's a tough one for most people because they're, you know, they're kind of conflicted halfway through that. Uh, so getting back to the uh, the trends, I think what I was showing you earlier, a uh, small Tonto style knife with a neutral handle that's grippy, that you're not going to slide on, that you know, uh, James Williams had some uh, videos of him punching this through a car door, uh, like a metal, uh, sheet metal, right? And uh, he said, the people that said that you need a guard and your hand is going to slide don't know how to hold the knife. And I agree with him. Uh, certainly, you wouldn't want this to be a slick micarta, but you could still get it to work if you have a small handle and you know how to palm it, right? So you've got a backup built into the pommel like that. Uh, but the neutral handle... I think they're going to sell a lot of these. They just came out this year. This one came from Lamnia, where when I can't get any, anything anywhere else, I go to Lamnia. They're in Finland. Oh, okay. And what, uh, I get it in two days, uh, FedEx Express. Who is the manufacturer of this? Is this a uh, Winkler? This, I know the this is Lion Steel. Lion Steel. Okay. I know and Winkler uh, did a uh, limited uh, edition for Williams. Sorry. Uh, this is Chris Williams, and it's from Sleepner Steel. Okay. Man, that's that's a beauty. There are some slightly larger ones made out of M390. So, but, so you're you're saying that you think that uh, small fixed blade knives that are pocketable are are a growing trend. I actually, um, <clears throat> yeah, I tried to get someone interested in a design of that that I had, who's. Uh, who, who will go unnamed right now, but is a, uh, you know, is in the industry. And, and he, he said no, uh, because he said he, he didn't think that that was what's happening. And, and, um, you know, he's the guy with the knife company. So I just, I politely thanked him for his advice, but, yeah. um, yeah. I, I kind of was thinking like you're thinking, like, I, I also think that, um, folders will always be more popular because of the fidget factor and the acceptable yeah. and ease of carry. Yep. But, um, but I do see a growing, um, people and, also love expanding their EDC. So I could see people going yeah. for the smaller, less martial, but smaller fixed blade knives. Stasa loves small fixed blade knives and yep. they're not, you know. Well, just to uh, stay on that topic for a moment. Uh, this is a new acquisition from Bastinelli. Oh, God, I love this. This is the uh, Tellum. And uh, Tellum is uh, basically a term which uh, has to do with spear, right? A, a javelin or a spear or an arrow. And uh, I was always looking for a perfect Pakal, Pikal knife. 
because uh, one of my instructors, Bill McGrath, said the perfect knife is a three inch. Now, this is around two and a half, a three inch double edged knife. Uh, similar to what I think SOG came out with uh, years ago as a mini Pentagon. Yep. So you have a full-sized handle. No compromising your grip. You have a built-in guard. And you have on this one a dual-function edge. So you've got the teeth, which will rip and cut but are also useful for a rope strapping utility, right? So we have here a broad, small double-edged knife where this distance from the edge to the center can be roughly what you got for a grind on a single-edge pocket knife. So you've got a usable utility edge if you want to look at it that way. You have a package that is small and concealable, drops right in a pocket. Uh, this is the uh, Tracker Dan clip that it comes with. Yeah. Interesting thing about that blade design, too, is at the base of the blade, the Ricasso, you also have the 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 full width of a full dagger. So, so, uh, right. so if you push that in up to the hilt, you're still getting an opening the same size, right? just not the same depth, but you get my point. I get your point, Bob. No <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. Pun greatly, greatly. I'm intended. using that pun all the time. So what are the knives you don't like out there? What, what, you know, maybe these are knives that people love and you're just like, I yeah. don't get it. So what, what is it? Well, I, I hate to cast aside an entire brand. Oh, yes. Uh, but I'm not real fond of the work Shielden was doing. Mm. Uh, they came out and they approached me. And I took my time getting back to them. And now they're not responding to me, which is fine. But they had asked me, I think, to do some reviews. I sent you the BOA and I sent you the Tranchodon, I think. Mm-hmm for a giveaway. And it doesn't make them guys that got those knives. They're not bad knives. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, their workmanship was kind of marginal. Uh, some things about them were good. Some things about them weren't the Tranchodon. I know that uh, Mike Emler, he kind of panned that uh, for a number of good reasons. And uh, you know, I thought it was okay, but um, I'm not, I'm not real high on the brand. I think maybe uh, there's certainly a lot of room for improvement. So they may come out with something terrific at the end of this year. Who knows? But um, for the money, I would buy a petrified fish any day for 35 bucks. Oh, yeah. It would stomp all over, you know, everything else. I mean, even Civivi because Civivi tends to make I would say a more delicate knife, one that you can't beat on too hard. At least that's my perception, right? Mm -hmm. My humble opinion. Uh, I have plenty of Civivi knives. I've probably got a good 15 or so uh, Civivi folders. I've got some excellent Civivi fixed blades, uh, like the one that was designed by uh, Bob Trizuola. Um, and... Uh, there was a few other. There was a new one uh, designed by a guy that's kind of a combatives instructor, and it turns from uh, it angles off into a karambit yeah. and then straightens out. I picked that one up. That's a real odd one, but I'm just saying, dollar for dollar, I would get petrified fish any day for a really great solid knife. Everything about them is perfect. The action's perfect. The lockup is perfect. The deep carry is perfect. Uh, I'm sure there's some flaws that people have encountered depending upon the environment they're using it in. But for me, um, you know, I'm high on uh, petrified fish. That's why I probably got a dozen of them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting um, what you said about shielding, too, because uh, the boa uh, that we gave away, with that cool Tonto, that was a really... Nicely made knife. The Tranchidon, 
uh, one for style points, but I agreed with Mike's, uh, with Emler's, uh, uh, prognosis of that knife. It was a, pro it did have its problems, but I think where, where Shielden is going to shine in the future is if, with OEM work. Uh, I had a chance to check out Devo knives. Yep. That's, uh, you know, uh, lefty EDC and, uh, Colin Maison Pierre, their, their work, uh, their growler, which is coming out was, uh, they had it prototyped by Kubi and Shielden, and they're going with Shielden. And I had a chance to check out that wow. prototype. Great. They did a great job. So, so sometimes yeah. maybe what you need is the direction of a of a passionate designer. If you, know. you feed if you feed a good solid company a, a adequate design, and their designs weren't the greatest, but and I think their their machining and their fit and finish needed a bump up too, but I think if they're making it for somebody else and they got to satisfy that customer, I think they can rise to the occasion. Let me ask you this, Dave, as a fellow um, uh, knife as martial tool uh, guy, as a knife, as a fellow knife as weapon guy, um, did it take you any time to come around to knives as a, just a tool as an EDC thing? Uh, probably not because, um, I mean, before there were clips on knives, I was carrying a Pardue, Mel Pardue, uh, lock back in my pocket every single day, the same knife. And it got used for everything. It probably even got used for a screwdriver when it shouldn't have, but you know, it, it was used to pry things, cut things. And I doubt that I sharpened it that much either. I, at that time, I needed somebody to show me how to sharpen a knife because I wasn't that adept at it. And I had a good friend who became a martial arts student of mine who showed me uh, how to sharpen a buck knife on, uh, you know, an Arkansas stone. Nice. And, and I started developing uh, an appreciation for sharpening from that. Uh, but yeah, uh, I was, uh, EDCing that knife back in, uh, I would say the mid seventies. Okay. So, okay. All right. All right. So knives are a part is it's almost like they were two separate things in a way. Knives have always been a part of our daily lives. At some po point they were stigmatized. Um, but, uh, I, I feel so everyone was probably carrying a pocket knife and then the birth of these modern things. And yep. then it becomes a whole a whole new world. I want to try something uh, before we wrap here, Dave. Uh, I, I, ha I do. Bob, I haven't shown you everything on the table yet. Oh, but <laughs> well, we're going to do an interview extra for the patrons. We, here. We'll have to do a ceiling cam and, and just give you a, <laughs> I'd love that. I would love that 24 hour ceiling cam over your desk. That'd be awesome. So I usually do a speed round and I've done that with you before. Yep. Um, but so it, it made me think, I'm going to read off 15 brands and I want you to rate them one to 10, 10 being the highest. Um, and just so you know, uh, well, no, I'm not going to give you that information. Are the manufacturers watching right now? Do no, I, <laughs> yeah. do, I, do I get any points yeah. for, for kind all things? the way <laughs> around? Uh, okay. All right. So, all right. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. Spider Co. Ooh, uh, okay. Ten's the highest. One is the lowest. Yeah. Uh, uh, seven. Bastinelli. Uh, nine and a half. Cold Steel. Uh, six. Petrified Fish. Uh, eight. Civivi. Seven. Maxes. Eight. Benchmade. Uh, eight. Riyadh. Um, ten. Uh, Chris Reeve knives. Uh, I had his fixed blades in the seventies. Based on that experience, I would say a nine. Concept. A nine. Kaiser. Uh, eight. Emerson. Uh, 
based on past experience, I don't have any. Uh, seven. Fox. Yeah. Their own brand or OEM? <laughs> mm, Fox. <laughs> Fox. Okay. Got to have the name on the name on the knife. Okay. Uh, seven. Okay. And two more. Uh, Demco knives. Never had one. Okay. So I got to opt out of that. But I feel that his uh, shark lock, uh, what, 8010.2? 20.2. 20.2. 20. Um, I would give it a five just because I don't think it's worth 150 bucks. Sorry. It's okay. an innovative lock and it's too small, which is why I don't have one. I think oh. I would I would pay I would pay 75 bucks for that knife and no more. And I know I probably spent more for knives that other people say that uh, wouldn't be worth it either. But well, it is a matter ultimately of your taste and and yeah. And what you like size wise. I well, have yeah, one too, too small and materials need a bump up. Okay. All right. So I got one last brand. All right. <laughs> um, so actually, no, no, no. I'll, I'll add, I'll add two more, uh, because Demco will, will just take Demco off. Uh, okay. Second to last is Boker. Hmm. Uh, six. And then the last is artisan cutlery. Uh, eight. Eight. All right. All right. So I think if we compile that, we can, we can, we can crunch the numbers and then <laughs> we can extract what your exact tastes are. Well, you're going to come uh, up with an algorithm, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and uh, I'll get back to you on what type of knife collector you are. Hey, Dave, thanks so much for coming on the show and for catching us up. Uh, I love your collection. I love your taste in knives. And, and you've been very generous to this channel. Also, I forgot to mention, just in giving, uh, passing along some of your knives that we pass along to others and uh, of course you've passed along a couple uh, that you've say stay with me like this one what a beauty and and these yeah. kind of gifts mean more than you know so thank you so much Dave for coming on the show thanks for having me Bob and Always thanks a pleasure. everybody out in uh, YouTube land take care do you use terms like handle the blade ratio walk and talk hair pop and sharp or tank like then you are a dork and a knife junkie. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Dave of This Old Sword Blade Reviews. You know, one of these days, we got to meet halfway at some uh, rest stop on the highway and uh, and bring our, our hundreds of knives. I got to check out that guy's collection. Amazing stuff. Um, anyway, good man, and it's always a pleasure to have him here on the channel. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have everyone here on the channel. Check out next Sunday's show for another great interview and uh, Thursday Night Knives right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch live at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Thursday night. And, uh, of course, the Wednesday Supplemental. In there, sprinkled in, are uh, close-up videos on knives because I just cannot stop talking about knives. For Jim, working his uh, magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.